and I, I guess we'll have our introductions around the table. We'll start here to my right. Forest Dunbar Assembly. And I'm Lisa Tucson. I'm the Administrative Hearing Officer for the Municipality. Barbara Jones, Municipal Clerk. DNS Attorney for the Ethics Board. Amanda Moser, Clerk's Office. And our visitors? Uh, Devin Kelly from EDM. Dan Alexine, DW, LLC. All right. Great. Well, uh, thank you. And I guess we'll uh, get uh, our update uh, from the Board of Ethics on the uh, ethics rewrite. rewrite. Okay. And can I, for everybody's benefit, introduce uh, Lisa Toussaint. Um, she is a second attorney for the Ethics Board, and I don't think people know that she's uh, doing that kind of backup. We, Of course, I'm identified more with the administration because I work with the Municipal Attorney's Office, and in, by code we support the Ethics Board. But we've uh, been uh, using the Administrative Hearing Officer attorney for a couple years now behind the scenes because she's appointed by both Assembly and Mayor. Uh, and so, uh, um, there, and she was firewalled from the uh, Department of Law. So we figured that we use a second attorney, especially if there's an issue of, about the administration, then we would just turn it right over to her. But I don't think people realize that that protective layer has, we've just done it informally. Oh, well, great. Thank you. So Lisa Toussaint. Thank well, you. Um, uh, and in terms of the ethics you write, we did, we have an initial draft. It went before the ethics board uh, about two weeks ago for the first time. They only looked at it for about 20 minutes. It took a, uh, what's currently a 40 plus page uh, code section and got it down to about 14 pages. Uh, collapsed the three groups into one setting, which I think is much more helpful. Tried to address a number of concerns that have been raised to us, for instance, uh, um, elected officials going to um, charitable organizations. The rules were very difficult to navigate about such a simple matter. Um, the political section has been totally rewritten um, because I think that it was, it was mostly outdated, that it reflected um, old economics when people would uh, advocate for something with brochures and they had to use city money to pay for those brochures. Now you have uh, websites. Uh, we tried to put in something about, uh, for instance, that uh, APOC, if an if, uh, elected official does something that's a official and usual duty or customary and usual duty, then there's all sorts of protections, uh, less um, regu regulatory um, attention. So we said that, we defined that in the code. We put um, that if uh, you're elected in part because of your municipal opinions and therefore your expression of the munis municipal opinions is part of your customary and usual duties define it in the code. So um, our hope is that this is now going to go back to the ethics board at the next meeting. Um, they are going to decide what they can and cannot live with because there are a number of ideas. The rule of necessity, uh, uh, Mr. Dunbar, you missed that one. That was when the entire um, oh. assembly voted on uh, moving the election date that substantially affected their personal financial interests. But they all had the same conflict of what could we do. So that has been incorporated into this new version. Um, so anyway, that the, the ethics code, the ethics board will take the first shot at uh, what they can, can and cannot live with, and then hopefully get it to you very quickly. Uh, a lot of them like the rule of necessity is a policy decision, not so much an ethics decision, but really the assembly has to make their own decision. I see. So moving along pretty quickly. So we're not yet to the point then when we uh, are going to recommend this to the full body or not. We're, we still have a couple more meetings. To go. I would think so. I would think that I'm hoping this gets to you the next your next meeting. Okay. And then I would imagine that you'll want a, a work session and that we would walk you through that. Okay. Great. Oh, a work session for this committee. I'm not sure. I think that might be a good idea to have a work session for this committee because you need a sponsor, although of course the mayor could sponsor it. Um, but if you wanted to, then if this committee could walk through it, then they could probably help the rest of the assembly at a regular work session. Mm -hmm. well, that, that sounds like a, a possibility. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll have to see what happens at the next meeting when we get the report. Uh, and depending on, you say it's quite a few pages, it, you know, it, it, it might take a, mm -hmm. um, a, a little bit of time for us to, to feel like we're ready to recommend it to, to, the, to the assembly as a whole. So we'll, we'll have to see. There's no use hurrying in as long as as long as we've been uh, working on it for a, a couple of months already. So, um, I have one other question, Dee. One of the issues that has come up in the last um, couple of years was the uh, state marijuana prop, 
where the assembly um, passed a resolution um, actually opposing the marijuana proposition. And I am just wondering if you could explain, is that considered usual and customary for the assembly members to take positions on um, now, I'm asking right. in the new, if that would be usual and customary part of their duties to take a positions on those types of things. Yeah. I, I think we defined usual and customary as to an individual. Mm -hmm. That was the body taking a position. Okay. And so that's a very different, and so that wouldn't be usual and customary. We in fact put a provision in there that will be subject to some debate that said that the uh, <coughs> Uh, that the assembly would not uh, take a, uh, uh, by assembly resolution <coughs> take a position on uh, issues um, that were not before that were I think it was jurisdictional or something that that it, under this provision we put in they would not be uh, permitted to do that hmm. that they would not be able to state a, per, uh, a majority position mm -hmm. um, on a non-municipal or a non or an issue that was before a different body. What's the uh What's the justification for that? We just did it again. We just did yep. it for the PFD voter. Um, what's the, the, the reasoning behind that? There was um, both members of the ethics board and members of the public were actually quite offended by the marijuana one taking a position or not. It was very interesting that, 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 that the assembly should not be uh, telling the voters how to vote. Um, versus, um, I think there's a lot more mo mundane issues that come up. Coastal management plan mm -hmm. was one that was before them. Well, I mean, other bodies, I believe, and correct me if mm -hmm. I'm wrong, but the legislature does these kind of resolutions very frequently. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, well, I don't know, Pete, uh, maybe you can speak to this, but I mean, we, we do resolutions in favor of, you know, um, we just did one in Women's Equality Day, for example, and there's no there's no vote there, but we do these kind of resolutions all the time. And how do you how do you define whether or not we're taking a position on something that could be up for vote and something that is just us saying, you know, we we support women. We just said we support. We just said last night we support when women's uh, pay equality. Okay, but it's the Lily Ledbetter Act. There are efforts now to pass laws to promote women's. Uh, equality, uh, pay equality, so we violated that. I, I would argue that they're different, and I think if you read them, number one, the Women's Equality Day is under your agenda, agenda on recognition resolutions. The other resolutions that we're talking about are under resolutions for action. And so um, there, there is a difference but between um, the way that you handle those and the clauses in the recognition resolutions are just all whereases. There's there's no there's no action like we agree to become a partner in um, women's pay equality. That is not part of the resolution. It's supporting the YWCA that's working for pay equality but it's not the assembly taking a position. And members do decline to sponsor those. So what if... Um, so I don't know if that's... A, I don't, I'm not saying that that's a definitive answer for that. That's something more probably for D, but there is a slight agenda difference. So what about something like AO 37, that repeal, or the, um, you know, what they colloquially refer to as the summer of hate, like six years ago, right? So in, in those examples, you had something that was before the body that went one way or the other, and then now there's a, a now there's a um, a ballot initiative on the municipal ballot where we would be would be allowed to comment as a body on those kind of things, or are we barred from those as well? No, I think you would be allowed to under this because it would be. Uh, I mean, it, it is that's a municipal issue and it's a municipal code change. So those ones, I think, are pretty safe. But, well, it's true, but it's also a plebiscite, and it's not directly mm -hmm. before us. And so how are you making, you know, something like marijuana or the PFD voter, that mm -hmm. also directly impacts uh, municipal code. We were mm -hmm. going to have, at least, at least the marijuana one, we're going to have to change municipal code, and we mm -hmm. did. Um, so I just... Well, Forrest, can I interrupt you? I, I yeah, think what on. I did was, I knew that was an issue, as Barbara <laughs> brought it up, so I put it in there, a paragraph, you can't do it. Yeah. That will be one of the ones that will be highly debated and potentially could derail getting the new ethics code in there. So it, that may be one that 
um, that you say, wait a minute, this, this isn't worth a public debate at this point in time. But half the assembly was very offended by those as well, and we almost didn't vote on them. We had a couple of uh, ethics board members. I'm not one of the ones that, I, again, I think you should have your opinions. Uh, it, it concerns me a little bit the tyranny of the majority that you know, we are for this type of right, or we are f against this type of right. Just that's a pure partisan. Sure. But you can put it on your website. Right, and that's well, how that's how ordinances. That's exactly what an ordinance change is too. It's the tyranny of the majority. You know. Right. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, and you know, some people, as I recall, said that they thought the assembly was trying to influence the outcome of the election by passing this resolution. And if that was actually the, the intent. Then I could I could certainly see where some people would, would be offended by that, but if if it was just strictly a straw vote saying well who on the assembly is in favor of this type of thing, I, I, that that would be a, a, a little, but it's it's hard to distinguish, mm -hmm. w w you know, mm -hmm. what what the outcome is going to show is it going to show just a straw vote or is it going to show that we're are we really trying to influence, influence the election. And when I was in the legislature, we passed resolutions to Congress all the time, mm -hmm. and they had about the same effect as shaking your fist at the mirror. You know? <laughs> I mean, they totally. And we it was more or less a waste of time, but it, it gave members uh, of the legislature a chance to get up and vent, you know, and get it on the record. Why? And, and so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't think that there. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, so I agree that most of the resolutions that was passed by um, that august body were a total waste of time. But um, <laughs> I, I. But I do think there is a, 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 a an effect that is positive for democracy in the sense that voters know where you stand on an issue. You know, and aside from campaign literature, it's one of the few times you can take uh, an, uh, a position on an issue. Um, that might not be directly before the body, but might have a direct impact on the body going forward, like marijuana. And I think it would be interesting to go back and look at the voting record, and it's a different group of people, but you might have people who voted on the marijuana thing who, sa who said they didn't find it super offensive, who then voted the other way, saying it was offensive on the, um, on the PFD voter thing. So uh, I, 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 I think that there might be some people who have that very principled stand, but I suspect that actually it's kind of a reflection of partisanship. And, and in my case, I am totally fine with with either way. I mean, I, I mean, what I'm saying is I'm totally fine with these resolutions. And I would have voted against the marijuana resolution on the merits, but I wouldn't have been offended that people were saying that we as a body are opposed to the marijuana legalization. And then obviously I brought forward the resolution for the PFP voter thing. So, um, I, yeah, I, my, my opinion is I, I don't think there's an issue with it. I, do you have, I mean, so you said the ethics board itself has some kind of... A few members. But, but so I put it in there as sort of a placeholder because a few members did it enough for the community uh, uh, voice objection. But, but this, this group may say, hey, this is too controversial. This isn't a clean standard. Let's not put that in this ethics code. Mm -hmm. And that would be fine. So, but I put it in as a placeholder because it has come up. Yeah. And we should know because then assembly members come to us and say, well, can we put this on the, and we just don't have any clear standard versus, hey, it did not make the ethics code cut. Well, I, I expect the assembly as a whole will We'll have a robust discussion about the issue that comes up. Um, so, um, I think the ethics board should take it out before it comes to you. <laughs> we don't want it to derail. Or, or I think that's another good reason why it comes to this committee yeah. first right. before it goes sure. to the assembly as a whole. Well, I, I hope that the next when it finally does come, you know, I, 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 and I know you will give us some more. Uh, heads up, like this is going to be this, the meeting we actually vote on it so we can get a little bit more participation because mm -hmm. when it's just me and Pete, I feel like you know we're, we're giving a little bit too much uh, authority to weigh in for the whole for the body as a whole. Because okay. okay, so 80% of this rewrite is, is, is straightforward, it's right. putting you know, shortening it, making it more concise, trying to update it with the times. There's only a handful, I'd say probably two or three provisions. That are going to people are going to debate. They're going to debate that rule of necessity. I think, except I think the assembly will be in support of it. Um, so there's very few that are controversial with that. One, actually, except that one exception. Great. Well, let's move down to number three uh, on our agenda. And we we have received this letter from Can I, J Jana. Is is, yeah. is Lisa done? Yeah, I think we're okay. Sure, we might be. Okay. Yeah. Are you, are you finished or do you want to stay around longer because we're going to be talking about 
the potential conflict of interest with Patrick Flynn. Could I could I add something about that just quickly? With the ethics Certainly. Board, that, uh, out of order. Um, the ethics board under the current code, uh, the ethics board only reviews uh, the adequacy of disclosure of the elected officials, and certainly there's been a fair amount of disclosure. Um, although that you may have additional questions, um, the ethics board doesn't weigh those factors. That that really is a decision that's given to the assembly in the public forum. So even though we were invited to weigh in, um, I think that uh, we have, I haven't had a full meeting of the ethics board, but they would, under the current code, say no, that really disclose, there has been disclosure that it would be your decision. I see. Okay. The, the, assembl the, the assembly, assembly's decision, 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 right, decision. because there has been adequate disclosure. All right. In a public forum. Okay. All right. Well, I, I guess Sorry. then you, you two are, are uh, free, free to go then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have some lunch. You too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So I guess we'll move on to number three. And do you want to make a presentation or talk about your letter or? Can I can I say something before? Sorry, John. Before we go forward, but certainly. So I I have a question first for you, Amanda. What exactly, or actually for you, Barbara? Either of you. <laughs> sorry, I, I'm used to Barbara was gone for a while, so. Uh, so what uh, what kind of recommendation? What form would a recommendation possibly look like that we could potentially come up with today? Well, first of all, you, that is totally up to the committee. You can make a recommendation to the body as a whole that they reconsider the decision. You can make a recommendation that they reconsider the decision and look at the certain factors. In fact, I'll walk back to my office and grab the factors that you're supposed to consider. So um, I'm, go get those. I'm not positive where it is. I think it's, it's that here. little, yeah, that little goldenrod piece of paper. Um, so you could say we recommend that the assembly look at these factors. You know, um, you could specifically say that I think one factor was found in error or that some other factor outweighs it. So it's entirely up to the committee how you wish to proceed. Um, and then at the committee reports, you would make a recommendation to the assembly as a whole. Um, it was referred to you. You could also say we chose to take no action. You could defer it to your next meeting. You could schedule a special meeting. So um, basically, the sky is the limit. Okay. Um, so can I say something? Go ahead. Before we discuss this, um, I am not comfortable making any kind of recommendation on this without Patrick here or on the phone to talk to this issue. So I wonder if we could maybe take a break and try to get him on the phone and so we could talk to him. He um, he declined. Yeah, I got a text from him this morning that said he wouldn't. Well, maybe we could call him and tell him my view because he didn't tell me that and there's only two of us. So right. no recommendation can go forward right now. If I say I'm not going to make a vote, then or I vote, you know, against it, right. it's going to go forward with the recommendation. Yeah. So. Um, he doesn't know that, he doesn't know there's only two people here, right. and he doesn't know that I feel that way. So could we try to call him and get him on the phone? Absolutely. But, I mean, we could perhaps have uh, Jana go first. If yeah, you want to. I mean, I just have a couple points that maybe um, weren't as articulated in that letter as I would like it to, but I attended the work session last week that the assembly held on, on matter, and then also attended the um, subcommittee matter, the new layer of that two week you know, before the assembly. I forget the name of that committee, but um, and I kept hearing a reoccurring theme, and it was, you know, uh, Mr. Trainee brought up in front of the DHHS um, spokesperson who came, and she wanted to do an odor um, control test, and he said, well, do you go to alcohol establishments, and do you? sit on the four corners of their property and do you, do you test for smell? And she goes, well, well, no, we don't do that. Well, do you ask the licensees to do that? Well, no, we don't do that. Well, if you don't do that there for alcohol, why are we doing it here? And uh, Mr. Peterson did the same analogy in the work study session where he, he made, you know, we're supposed to regulate this like alcohol. Why are we doing certain things that aren't like alcohol? Well, the signage code, we're gonna do that like alcohol. All these different things, we're trying to maintain consistency. We're trying to make consistency in an area that already has a lot of subjectivity. So my, my issue with this is, if the assembly already has a consistent pattern on handling conflicts of interest, 
in areas such as alcohol, where they disclose it, but they still vote on licenses that they don't have an interest in. Um, same thing with development group, same thing, you know, all these things that are exactly the same type of analogy, but then, and we are consistently applying it in all these different industries, and then we apply a, an inconsistent, um, an inconsistent formula here, where just because it's new, um, and just because we choose to subjectively, it's a slippery slope. I mean, why, why, why are we adding more subjectivity into an area where we have consistency, where we know what the right answer is? We've already done this with alcohol. We know that Patrick Flynn owns pieces of other alcohol licenses. Why is he voting on the, in that industry, but not voting in this industry? That subjectivity and the difference of treatment is really what we're trying to get away from here. Right. Um, and then on, on, on top of it too, just from, you know, I don't represent, I represent maybe two companies in the Mountain View area. And I, I certainly don't represent uh, Patrick Flynn's company. Um, one of those companies you already seen go through, Dream, Dream Green Farms. You know, this is an area that has a lot of industrial land. It has a need for high employment. It, it's lower income. And they have elected Patrick Flynn every year he's about to term out. And it, they're their, his only representation. I mean, you can't. It's a high industrial area, and then to take away their their trusted representation in an area in a time period where they really do need to hear have their concerns be heard, just because of an inconsistent approach to this new industry, it just it doesn't sit well with me. And I don't think it really depends on his business structure or his business specifics. I don't think that's relevant. I think what's relevant is. How do we handle this in other markets? Let's do the same. Well, you know, and uh, Mr. Flynn's been on the assembly for over eight years. Uh, he's been participating in the renewal of liquor licenses and, and dealing with applications of new liquor licenses for that entire time. The only time he's been recusing, recusing himself is when uh, a, a business that he was part owner of came up for a renewal. And so, to, to be consistent, I think that should be the same situation with marijuana licenses. Uh, I think a precedent has been set, and uh, that, that's my opinion on the matter. But we can call back against telling that you have some questions for me. So like here's to. the original. Those are the questions. Those, that's the, the, the detailed info. Here are the questions that Amy asks. Right. And then here's some copies for you for us. So there's, this is the front detailed page, but these are the questions that Amy asks at each of the meetings. Right. Okay, so um, did you want this one, Pete? Sure. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Well, I remember during our discussion, we went through these, and, um, and, and I think on these five ones, the initial ones, we 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 determined that he was you know within the bounds right but to me i remember in our discussion i still feel like e is the one that on the detail page e is the one that we uh, uh the e line three or will diminish the public trust is sort of what we got um, hung up on so even if it is not a substantial financial interest in him uh there is the issue that um, and we've, we've already seen it and I think received, I know I've received messages on it and maybe you have too, where people feel like um, he cannot be objective on these issues, whether or not we believe that's the case. Um, and to me, the reason I don't think it's analogous to uh, what Janet said to the liquor industry uh, is because we have, what, I think 177 liquor licenses in Anchorage or something along well, those lines. Yeah. 300 oh, or 400. It's a, it's a large Oh, okay. Number. Well, even better. I heard the number 177 last night. It must have been it's, a specific kind of liquor license. Remember, they renew every two years. Okay. So we have 500 liquor licenses. And if we were at the very beginning of the liquor industry and there were only three or four liquor licenses, I think then it would be more analogous to where we are today because there is a first mover advantage in these uh, in industries. And, and I think the fact that he is in on the ground floor versus um, development that's widespread or liquor licenses where we have hundreds and hundreds of them, I think it, I don't think it is analogous. And for that reason, I think there is a, a heightened um, worry about diminishing the public trust um, 
in this industry. That being said, if I could get some details from Pat, I think there might be a way to reach a kind of compromise here, but I need to talk to him. Um, and so, can we get him on the phone? We'll see if he'll answer. And then, could I speak to the first person that leaned part? Sure. You mentioned. So where they're at in their licensing process, I mean, they, from my knowledge, haven't even made a September agenda. So for AMCO, for the last Marijuana Control Board purposes, they're not even going to be on the agenda until the end of October. And that means they can't even submit an SUP to you, to you guys probably until mid-October, right. and you're still 75 days away. Green well, Green Farms, we started our application process, I believe, in May, I want to say. Right. I mean, a really long time ago. So uh, the first mover thing, it... it, it well, so the issue isn't so much where they're at, it's the fact that he would have the ability to potentially stop or slow down licenses that are gonna get in before he will. And so, and then I would say the actual opposite of that is true because what's been happening um, and why I took such a, a jolt to this, what is, you know, Patrick's been actually somebody on the assembly that has educated himself and become familiar with the, with the system and, and done economically feasible common sense approach to this, right? He's actually facilitated a lot of the movement here and, and actually gotten a lot of things um, through that makes sense for the industry. And we just had Bruce Schulte, an industry representative, removed from the board, and I saw that as a, you know, kind of a prohibitionist stab. And then I see Patrick Flynn. Hey, Patrick, it's uh, Pete Peterson. We're here in the Ethics and Election Committee meeting, and uh, Forrest Dunbar had actually a couple questions he would like to ask you, if you got a minute. Okay. okay, all right, here's Forrest. So can you put it on the speaker yeah. and then please let him know oh, that it it's, being it's being recorded. So Pat, Pat, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. So um, you are currently on the record uh, at the Ethics and Elections Committee. Is that okay? Is that okay? No problem. All right, and uh, please maintain good driver safety. Um, so I guess my, my, my question basically is this. So. I have heard reports, but not directly from you on the record, about the nature of your business. And I don't want you to have to re reveal, like, you know, deep uh, industry secrets or whatever. But, uh, you know, we've been looking at the, in the marijuana industry as a monolith, when really there are four pretty distinct segments, correct? The cultivation, testing, manufacture, and retail, right? That is correct. And I had heard that you were only involved at this stage, and, and I know you're not even, it's still pretty speculative, but it looks like you're going to be getting into the cultivation business. Is that correct? That is also correct. And you don't have any plans at this moment to get into the testing or manufacture business? <coughs> that is correct. And while there might be retail sometime in the future, it's still very, very speculative. Is that right? That is also correct. Okay. Uh, that's all I needed. That's all I wanted to hear on, on the record, Patrick. Thank you. Do you have anything else you want to add? I'm sorry. Uh, that, that's all I wanted. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I appreciate the committee's deliberation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. All right. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Patrick. No problem, Pete. Thank you. No. Bye. Okay. Okay, that phone call's ended. So. Because of the information you just garnered from him, uh, what's, what's your feeling now? So I was wondering if there's ability, this is why I asked about what the recommendation is possible. And this is what the idea wanted to run by you. So we are currently working through cultivation licenses, um, which he has still speculative, but a fairly definitive stake in, I think. But he has no future stake in manufacture or testing, and he probably will, if he does do retail, it'll be very far down the road and it'll be more analogous, in my opinion, to the liquor licenses. Uh, because at that point, we'll have a number of other, uh, you know, and he might never get into it. So I would like to have a recommendation, if possible, where Patrick is prevented from debating or is barred from the cultivation discussions, but is allowed to participate on all the other licenses. That is my suggestion. I see. All right. Well, um, you know, I... I don't know. I, I still feel that um, that his his investment in this business was reported from Cynthia Franklin. I believe was at five point seven percent. That's 
you know, what, one eighteenth or one nineteenth ownership in, in a cultivation facility. And every time we approve another license, we approved one, another one last night, yep. his, the amount of ownership that he has amongst the industry will continue to be diminished. And so there's already four licenses approved. And so he's already down to probably less than 1%. And then once his license would be approved, it'd be even less than that. So I just think there's such a small percentage of the market that he is going to be an investor in that um, it's, I just don't see how there could be enough of a conflict. So I, I think you and me who know Patrick well and work with him and know uh, the nature of the industry at this point. I mean, you and I and Patrick, I think, are you know among the people who have, well, no, everybody has worked hard in, to get to know this industry. Um, and to me, it's about E uh, in our potential, the, the, on this form, right, at the bottom there. So it's not so much about the practical reality that you and I know in depth. It's about, to me, the, the public perception and the public trust. And uh, I think we have gotten enough pushback on this uh, that even with those arguments out there, uh, I, I do think there's going to be a segment of the population, fairly significant, that when, you know, let's say that, uh, uh, an so far we've been able to work through all the cultivation applications, and they have been, um, you know, with one exception, fairly straightforward. And the one that we had to work through, um, we eventually did pass. Um, but there might come a time in the near future uh, where we get a substandard application uh, and we feel we need to stop it. And I'm worried that if it's a cultivation license that, uh, and we stop it, that uh, there will be a perception that I, I agree is probably a mistaken perception, but there will be a, a sort of unavoidable perception in the public that, that um, that uh, Patrick had a conflict in that case. I see. And I also think that given our, so I, I think what Jana said is, is, is valid. I, I'm particularly um, persuaded by the point she made in the letter and the point that other of us have made that he is the only representative from downtown. Uh, and I think we should revisit that at some point and talk about why is the single member district only ever downtown. Maybe we should let that rotate. And I think it's something we should talk more about in the near future, about rotating the single member district as was intended by the charter, because I think we're currently in violation of the charter. Um, but um, the, the, uh, beyond that, um, her, you know, her, her other point about uh, his, uh, his technical expertise in allowing these things to go forward I think that's true and that's helpful. I think it's particularly true when it comes to testing and manufacturing and retail, which we're going to get to. They're going to be even more controversial in the retail. But at the, at, so far, we have been able to fairly quickly move forward the cultivation licenses. Uh, so I don't think the industry, if they see Patrick as a, as a voice of reason on this issue, are giving up much. And if we do run into one of these really hard to deal with cultivation licenses, uh, and we have to slow it down and stop it. I don't think the industry gets, if Patrick is there, like I said, I think the perception will be that he is conflicted because it, in the public's mind. So, I see. Um, well, you know, and I, yeah, well, I remember. Um, I, uh, I would like to say that the clerk's office would like to help you with a recommendation and we can, one of the things that we could do is take a look at that discussion or debate on the record on the um, public trust and we could help you come up with a talking point how, and your recommendation to the members. The, the other thing though that I wanted to suggest is what, what I have heard and I just wanted to play the devil's advocate and toss this out is that if a member owns a cultivation facility, the purpose of that cultivation facility is to sell marijuana to other retail outlets. Retail. And so, and I'm not sure if you would sell marijuana to a manufacturing facility. Yes, you would. So, you so the question, and, and this is, I'm just, 
and and the the comment was, well, um, people might tell Patrick they'll buy or any assembly member they'll buy marijuana from his manufacturing or his cultivation if he approves their retail license their retail or manufacturing license. So I think your argument is perfect for testing, but I just wondered if that would be the counter argument, what would you say to that? You know, I think it's it's not a, a bright line, it's a spectrum of the public trust, and I would say that at that point, to me, it's feeling a little more attenuated, right? In the same way that the fact that he might get retail some point in the distant future, I don't think is enough to, to violate the public trust and, uh, and um, and cause a conflict. I'll also say, if he does that kind, if he were to engage in that kind of practice, it's much easier to track down and realize that that happened, right? Um, there would probably be a there's a there's a conspiracy there, and conspiracies are easier to flush out than he himself sitting up there thinking, ah, oh, you know what, I'm going to vote down this cultivation facility. Um, so I, I I think that while it's a concern. Uh, I think it's a little bit, it's easier to monitor and it's a little more attenuated. And so I think the cultivation, the direct impact on the cultivation to me is stronger. Um, so Mr. Dunbar, one of the things that I think you might want to think about is um, you might want to ask Mr. Flynn if in fact he makes the decisions who to sell, which manufacturing facilities or retail um, operators the cultivation facility is selling to because that's your comment it's attenuated my guess is and I don't know this for sure but my understanding is he's an investor and he probably has absolutely nothing to do with that right the inactive in management of the actual right. business right, right. Um, well that's I mean that, that's a great thing to know um, if he was here we could ask him um, we could call him back. I also really wish we had at least a, th right now we're hung, right? Right now we have a 1-1 one -one tie, if, if we go how we're talking about. So there'd be no recommendation. There'd be no recommendation. If we could have a third person here, um, we could resolve this. Um, so I, I don't know, if we could continue this to another meeting and then get another person here to break a tie, or actually have Pat here so we can have a real discussion, um, I, I think that would be preferable to, to action today, or we could make no recommendation. Or, or we, we could have another, we don't have to wait another month to have another one of these meetings, right. we could call a special meeting uh, you know, and, and to try to get a, a schedule of time when some of our other members could be here, right. so that we would have are you comfortable more, than, more than two of us, because so there wouldn't be a chance for a tile. And we also don't we don't have we don't have any licenses up until for two more weeks. So if we were to do it next week and we were to resolve this, then we could vote on it. Right. You, we could you, resolve. You next. actually have a three week break. Oh, we do three weeks until the next oh, meeting. We Good try to, to do that every so often. <laughs> we get the. Good to know. <laughs> well, there's Labor Day is in there somewhere. So I right, that Labor Day, break. Fourth of July. We try to make a three week break. Well, great. Then, then we don't need Christmas, to. Yes. We don't need to rush this. Then, in my opinion, right. we could do another special meeting and get Pat here, hopefully, and certainly get a third colleague here, so that we have a little more robust debate. And as far as I know, I don't believe I have anything scheduled on the thirty first. We do. do do we have a calendar from the clerk's office about well, what might be happening on the 31st? 31st is always good because it's the fifth week, and we usually have meetings the first, second, third, fourth, fourth so the fifth is kind of a wild card week. Right. Oh, well, let's tentatively <laughs> try to maybe have our, uh, another meeting a week from today. I have a personal meeting from 1 to 2 on that day. Could we schedule any other time? Well, we, we could do it. This would probably be a half-hour meeting on because that'll be the only subject on our agenda. How would that be noon to 1230? Or we could do it 1130. Or 1130. Or 1130. Okay. Well, we let's do it Just at 1130. Saying, you know, I, won't be, I won't be here. Not that that matters. But okay. I, mean, I think your views were well represented in the letter. Okay. Uh, and um, if you want to call in, you could. Okay. Um, and hopefully. We, we can I can connect to. with you after the okay. meeting and get yeah. your information and send you the agenda and call in a donation. So what time on uh, Wednesday? 11.30 to 12. 11.30 to 12, okay. We'll make sure Dick and, and... You know, I'm not positive Dick, is Dick, Dick is still on this committee, okay. 
Yeah, I, was, I mean, just according to those. I like those. Okay, Eric. that's right. Dick, Dick and Eric. And before we go to our next item on the agenda, did you have one last thing you wanted to say, Jenna? Um, well, I guess if you're just if you're gonna kind of punt it to the next meeting, I just maybe I don't know if you guys know this, but like, how many assembly members have interest in liquor licenses? Do we know? Flynn Evans. Um, as far as I know, Mr. Flynn, I don't believe anyone else has recused themselves that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, currently I think it's just Flynn. I know the previous mayor had interest, so mm -hmm. that's all that I can remember. And the current mayor has interest. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. Cool. I know the Cross family has a winery, but I believe that's in Oregon. Yeah, it is. So, so but by the logic, by Barbara's logic, that could be, <laughs> no, I'm saying, right, so they can only sell to. And, that, and that's kidding. kind of the point that I was actually getting at. It was Barbara brought up a good point because that is an argument that is a slippery slope when we when we start differentiating, like slicing this and dicing this up into well, their cultivation, then they could sell to the retail, and they could have an agreement, and they could have a higher price per pound, and they could do all these things. That gets further and further into the weeds, no pun intended. It seems like if you wanted to protect the public's interest and in the in the trust of the process, something that's just either you're in voting or you're not voting, but then you're going to have to apply that to different industries. Well, I, I think that I don't. I, I disagree because of how new and young this industry is. I think it is different, and I think what you've made is a pretty strong argument to, to bar him from all discussion. <laughs> um, but I would prefer not to do that because of the other points you've made here about Mountain View. Um, all right. Well, I think we'll continue this to our next meeting uh, next Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. here in room 240. And uh, thanks you for your input. And I have your email here, so I'll follow yes. you. So let's move on to our update on our vote by mail, Miranda, or Amanda, yeah. sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I'll start, and Barbara's going to jump in a little bit here. We have been... Working very diligently this summer, we issued two RFPs, um, one RFP for the inbound mail, um, includes components of the signature verification, and the second RFP for the election management system and ballot tabulation. We have worked through the first RFP on the inbound mail. We have. Um, Work through the respondents' uh, response to the RFP. We've had demos from um, all three of the respondents, and we are sort of in the final stages of that RFP. The second RFP, we have um, gone through the what the um, respondents sent back to us. We've done preliminary scoring, and we have our demos set up for those three um, September 1st September 1st so it has been pretty arduous process quite a bit of information it's been a really great opportunity for everyone involved to educate themselves on the on a whole new system um, especially the inbound has been really interesting I think the, in the second RFP we all have some element of experience with election management system and ballot tabulation, so it's a little bit more familiar to what we're talking about, but it was a steep learning curve to familiarize ourselves with the inbound mail. So, I think that sounds good on the RFP side. That sounds great. And that has kept us really busy this summer. Right. We're also working on a couple of things. I think Amanda has a tour this afternoon of some space that Dennis and I have preliminarily looked at and um, think is a good option. We're gonna to talk to the steering committee tomorrow about the space and request the steering committee's approval to go forward in lease negotiations. So that is really, really a big deal. And, and where is this space located, if you don't know? Um, down in Ship Creek. Ship Creek, okay. Right. okay. We, um, we, we, we would like to be downtown Mountain View, Fairview. Those are uh, Amanda's and my personal preferences for a variety of reasons. They are centrally located to some degree. We think we can find space. The biggest problem is marijuana 
has priced us out of the market. <laughs> <laughs> so that has been a little bit problematic for us to find warehouse space. Well, we still haven't had any marijuana applications in East Anchorage, so. <laughs> Oh, interesting, interesting. We would East not, Anchorage. we would not shun East Anchorage. We just haven't, um, we just haven't had any offers or any space over warehouse space over there I that think, would suit us. Yeah, I think industrial space and warehouse space is fairly limited. We have Northway Mall. We did look into Northway Mall, um, and I would say Ship Creek was also in our our list of desired places because mm -hmm. of its proximity to downtown and because we've looked at a couple other spaces down there. Yeah, I consider it downtown. I don't well, know if that's true many, or not. Well, how many square feet uh, does this area have? I believe it's about, it's between twelve and 13,000. It's wow. very big, at, but um, mm -hmm. we, our, our model county is about 10,000. Um, they have, but they have about two and a half to three that storage space that we might not need um, however they told us that they would have liked to have additional space to have a um, accessible boat center at that location um, that would have because they're splitting up their staff so that was one thing they needed more space for and we think we would probably have enough space in this location for our observers and um, I don't know if either of you have been down in room 105 but I know Devin has and it is not a very comfortable place to have observers or press because we have um, sometimes like 15 workers yeah. and then if you have um, when we did have observers we had more than 15 observers and there's no clear line of sight across the room so if you're trying to manage a room and understand what's going on there's little nooks and crannies and corners and I think one of the advantages of this site is that it is big open warehouse space so for observers that want to come in and from a management perspective, it's really easy to understand just from a glance across the room, specifically what's happening where, I think was really good. Whereas when you walk into 155, people can be tucked around one corner and tucked around the other, and it makes it both challenging for our staff and for the observers. And one thing that Barbara and I have talked about since we've been in this, in with the elections is clear, open, transparent elections. and Sure. And I think so even just talking about site design, that's one thing that's really important to make sure that it is able and, to have and open transparent elections. So this facility has got a dock so that we'd be able to back a, a, a truck out to it, two, two docks, three yeah. docks. We're, um, we'll probably only have to use one for right now. Would we be renting the whole facility or are we sharing it with some? We we would be renting. It's a it's a much bigger building. Right. We would just be renting a portion of the building, right. and right now it would be we would be the sole tenant for that. Right. The long term plan, and um, you know this is not written down anywhere, but this is just um, you know the pie in the sky dream. Right. Is that we would like to work with the clerks and the jurisdictions in the valley. Right. You know, there's Palmer. Matsuboro, Wasilla, and Houston. Am I forgetting anybody? Tulkeetna. Tulkeetna is um, the, borough. the borough. But those, um, the four clerks out there, and actually the clerks in the whole state, right. are watching us very closely. Right. And if we go by mail, they would possibly use our facility. They would like to use our facility because they're never going to be able to. Right purchase this equipment. Right. So this is something I mentioned um, at a presentation that you were there at the right. AML. Um, I would like Anchorage to sort of get into the vote by mail business as it were at some point if we could because you're like we're the only ones who have the the um, don't 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 write, don't write. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but what I mean by that is that if we can do it and do it well, and we have the have done made the capital investment, then we should be we should try to spread that cost to other. Um, if we can do it accurately and securely, then it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you saw what just happened. We saw what just happened on North Slope, 
And I don't know if we, if there's any way that, that practically we could run that kind of election through these things. Um, but having all of these very far scattered sites has caused real problems in their elections. Um, and I don't think it was anything malicious. I think it's just a, a, a you know, a, a the the nature of these kind of elections. And if we can do these well, then why wouldn't other jurisdictions want to get on board? You know, you know if you only have an election every couple of years. Um, the people that work at the elections make mistakes more often. You know, if you're, right. if you're doing this all the time or every year, you're less likely to make mistakes, especially if it's someone that's been running the elections year after year after year. But if you have someone that hasn't, maybe hasn't done it in a couple or maybe four years, it's easy to, to forget and then mistakes are made. I think, um you know, Amanda, and I'm not sure how much either of you guys have traveled out into the bush, but um, we do some training with all of the clerks from Alaska. And you know, the interesting thing is some of the clerks who, who run elections are pretty small jurisdictions. Or, and so one of the dilemmas that I think my experience has been is that many of the clerks in those jurisdictions are brand new and next year they're brand new all over again and so um, Amanda and I have discovered that running an election is is really tough and you know you can learn how to do it and then like you said Pete get those workers and I will thank, say thank God for the 650 election workers that have worked for the city forever because they're probably the ones who saved us those first couple of years we were here. Um, but, um, and Devin already knows that. <laughs> Continuity is important. Right, so, so I think you're right, Forrest. I admit I never thought about that. I know that our clerks in the Valley are interested in working with us. Their elections are in October, right. but I really didn't think of the other jurisdictions. And the issue is it's not, it would not be difficult. We couldn't do too many elections right. in October. We could do some of these special elections, but when you're mailing ballots or ballot packages, right. there's no requirement that that come from Right. even Anchorage or Wasilla, the package can get mailed to the registered voters from anywhere right. and that happens regularly in the lower 48. Um, and then when the tabulation part starts, that's when we would, um, we would want that clerk, that jurisdiction to be part of the processing. We wouldn't just process it without them. We'd right. make sure that they were part of it. We'd come up with some type of a, a working agreement, a memorandum of, of an understanding of who does what. Sure. But I think that's a great idea. And the, the point that's really important to me is then that facility is being used exactly. year round instead of just um, half of the year. Right, because a lot of our costs are gonna be capital fixed upfront costs or fixed in the sense that regardless of how many elections we run through that space, it's gonna be the same cost to rent that same space. Same rent every month. Correct. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's something to explore. I think a number of jurisdictions will probably want to maintain just almost out of pride, the sense of control over their own elections, but in other, in other, you know, in other aspects, and I know the judicial system does this all the time, where, you know, uh, the Aleutian Islands are, you know, or Western Alaska is run through Fairbanks or Anchorage or that kind of thing for, you know, a variety of different services. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's something that, that we should explore. And I just, I guess I want to compliment you guys on the work you've done and just, you know, full steam ahead. I, I really think that this is, is a, um, could be really positive for the city and eventually for the state if we do it right. And, and so we're, we're sort of the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, you know, we can Pioneer. Pr prove that we're, we're yeah. doing it correct yeah. and, uh, and we do get an increase in turnout, which we are expecting. And that's the main reason we're doing this is to try to get additional participation in our elections. Um, then I, I think all of those are good things, and and then if, if the other jurisdictions decide they want to, uh, you know, use our facility, I think we could make that happen. And just to add on to your point, uh, Mr. Dunbar, if I may, through the chair, um, 
if you look at the states that are going vote by mail, it is in the West Coast and it's happening in states that are geographically diverse, spread mm -hmm. apart, and it, it has been a model that's very successful where folks are spread apart, and I think that Alaska is the perfect candidate for a vote by mail, and especially as you look at these uh, jurisdictions, rural Alaska, and the challenges mm -hmm. with administering elections, especially with the state, you know, there is a significant cost for the state as they mail this election equipment all around for it, and then I think the challenges that come with training and all that other stuff, it's, um, you guys heard about the issue in Shungnak. Or no, it wasn't Shungnak. You mean where the guy went home? Yep. Yeah, yeah. he locked Didn't up and went home. Yeah. He Didn't couldn't get a hold of him because he went home maybe or something like that. And the challenge that happened with the voters getting both the ballots, ballots both would be ballots. eliminated because you would be mailed the ballot for which you're registered with the vote right. by mail system. Well, they had one machine where uh, they had a technical problem with the counter and so they had a delay where they weren't able to count until they got a, a different. That was in uh, uh, that was in the YK Delta. Yeah. Like that, 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 these, that. these sticks or whatever memory sticks were deteriorating. I guess. You so this is before. the challenge, and I this is I would say one thing that I'm very concerned about with our elections is that the AccuVote system was purchased in 1998, and it is a aging election equipment. And if you look across the country. Uh, people have moved beyond the optical scan component because it is an aging election appointment. I always like to ask people, what cell phone did you have in 1998? And a pager. I didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> it was 2004. Was and how many cell phones have you had? Like how has your right. technology changed from the pager to the iPhone small computer in your pocket? I think one of the things that the worker who said that she passed out both ballots she said, well, we got an hour of training by video. Right. And you know, that's part of the issue that we're talking about, and I think that's a sell for us to help people with those elections, is that we can do better than that. Right. I think it also, in a weird way, if we were to do those kind of long, you know, far off jurisdictions, um, it also, I think, improves the voter trust in the elections, or it should, because, you know, in some of those villages, and even in places like Barrow, um, people know each other in a very distinct way, and if you were going to have some funny business, it would be because you know that person, and, you know, I've heard some stuff about what might have happened on the North Slope about people being pressured one way or another, who knows if it's true or not, versus we are sort of a neutral, we don't know who these are from, we don't really know the politics, we, we are neutral when it comes to those kind of far-off elections, so. That might be another selling point. Um, we'll see. A, a final selling point. I agree with you, Mr. Peterson, about increased turnout and the other issues. One of the other things that's really important to us about going to a vote by mail is the election administration. You, you can tell from all of these little issues that we've been talking about with the machines, with voters, um, training workers, election administration just gets much easier, so it's really important to us that we move forward on that. Centralized. Great. I thought you were going to say one last thing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say the best thing is that the voters have the opportunity to really educate themselves on the oh, issues when right? you have the ballot in front of you, in front of you uh, the comfort of your own home, and the yep. trusted resources that you Absolutely. want to use to educate yourself on all the issues from the candidates to the propositions to everything. So that is, we could go on and on. But. Yes, we could. <laughs> we're, we've been, Great. we've really, I, I would tell you, I think Amanda and I have probably been spending, you know, 80% of our time on this project and Jackie as well. And I would be remiss if I did not say something about our project manager. Um, you know, our DI is our project manager and Dennis Wheeler is the lead. And he is just, Everything is happening because he is really keeping us on task. All right. Thank you. Well, I think we've uh, run to the end of our meeting, and uh, since Devin's the only one in the audience, I don't know if we're well, going to ask her to participate. So we have there's another hearing right at one, right? What's the next one?
it's uh, oh did you know we had a tentative rules committee but we didn't get the notice out i'm sorry oh so we're not doing rules no I rules was told that. never mind all right Devin, my fire apologies away. well then we'll uh, adjourn this uh, committee till oh. a week from today at oh. 11 30. Devin has some questions but i could also just talk to you guys after you adjourn when would you, we can do that. Okay. Yeah. So it's not on the record. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Adjourned.